heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm in Adlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, AMD it rallies on AI optimism as the company says its artificial intelligence chip will generate billions next year. Plus, the UK summit on AI safety is underway in London with attendees including Kamala Harris and Elon Musk. We'll bring you the big takeaways and interviews from the event. And we'll push ahead to the Federal Reserve rate decision due out later this afternoon and look at the central bank's impact on, you guessed it, AI startups. But first, let's check in on these markets because, well, we do have some movement ahead of the all-important decision, but many are thinking, yes, rates are going to stay at that 22-year high for yet another month. We're seeing the Nasdaq up some seven-tenths of a percent. Maybe it's actually some of the economic data, Ed, that's weighing on, well, the bad news being good news once more. If we're seeing some of those factory orders coming in worse than expected, if we're seeing jobless claims actually just ticking up, we're indeed job openings starting to open up a little bit. Maybe this is something that we're trying to get this mixed picture of where the economy is really going. Whatever the case, we're seeing some buoyancy in tech. We're seeing some buoyancy in the bond market. Yields falling. That, of course, as we get a hint that actually we'll see a slowing of pace of growth in the amount of bonds that will be issued on the long dated end by the U.S. Treasury. So lack of supply means yields fall down. We're seeing the VIX index just lower a little bit as some calming over, of course, still concerns over geopolitics. Move on to what's happening in the world of crypto, though, because on the day, even as VIX pulls back, options protection may be lower a bit, even though we heard that Apple may be ticking up a little bit ahead of its earnings. We're looking at crypto just on the downside by about a percentage point. This is we see the dollar treading water at 34,000, though, Ed. What are you watching on the micro? AMD. This is the big technology story of the day, at least from a market mover perspective. We're up almost 8% on track for the biggest jump since May. The story, the MI300, AMD's AI accelerator, on track to start production and shipments in the final three months of the year. $400 million of revenue in the current period coming from its AI accelerator. $2 billion of revenue the company sees in full year 24. And AMD is saying this will be the fastest of its products to ever hit $1 billion of revenue. This is the direct competitor to NVIDIA's H100. We're talking about a GPU that ships as an assembled component for hyperscalers, data centers, and large AI startups to train LLMs, large language models, and foundation models. And that's despite giving its current period forecast $5.8 billion to $6.4 billion. The midpoint of that range was below street consensus. The concern for them separately is a slowdown in gaming chip sales. But AI to the rescue. And it's funny because the stock fell in after hours during the earnings call. It was weak during pre-market trading. And it's gone off like a rocket during the main session this Wednesday. It certainly has. So let's delve into someone who's perhaps benefiting from the rocket move. Ivana Delevska is with us, CIO of Spear Invest, AMD, a key holding. I'm interested in how you balance out that narrative that there is weakness, particularly in Europe, when you're coming to desire to get into industrial chips. There is worry about China, but AI is still the bright spot. That's right, Caroline. So we see AI as a pretty big opportunity, and it's not just on the GPU side for AMD. It's across the board, data center spending. So we believe they're going to benefit from this new chip, the Milano, but also from their CPUs as well, like the Bergamo and Genoa. And that was really the big surprise this quarter. Investors had expected that AMD's guidance was very aggressive for the second half of this year, but they were able to deliver and guide to still 50% growth for the data center segment overall. They're thinking, what, about a $2 billion run rate by the end of it? I'm, I'm interested as to whether you think these two players, NVIDIA and AMD, are going to be the ones that take all, whether the market is going to be so vast, that vast the TAM of $150 billion or so, that we can still see entrants taking market share. So we do see new entrants coming in. However, AMD and NVIDIA have the early start. So they're going to be able to capture a significant part of the market share. We're going to see some of the cloud vendors develop their own solutions as well. So we see them benefiting from this trend. Amazon has some new uh, products that they're introducing. But NVIDIA and AMD will be able to capture a big part of market share as their first movers in this market. Ivana, AMD shares are up 8%, as I said, on track for the biggest jump since May. And a lot of the sell side are talking about 
the MI300 being the catalyst for the stock, right? Your ETF includes both AMD and NVIDIA. The MI300 is a direct competitor to the H100, which is already out there in the real world in volume. So how do you play this? How do you consider the composition of the ETF going forward? So we see data center as a trillion dollar market that is going to need upgrading, right? So we see opportunities for multiple players. The, the shares of NVIDIA have stalled out recently due to China concerns and also people just being cautious on the AI being hype versus reality. But we do believe that we are going to see significant investments and we do think that these companies are going to be able to compound at over 50% CAGR over the next few years. The story of NVIDIA over the course of 2023 is a stock up almost 190%. Do you expect AMD's stock to track like the NVIDIA story did with the H100? If they can prove that they can scale up MI300 in, in the same way that, it, that NVIDIA did? Well, NVIDIA really got oversold at some point in the cycle. So a lot of what you're seeing here in terms of the move is from really depressed levels. So we do see similar upside from here for both NVIDIA and, and AMD. I mean, what's really interesting is, of course, you set up and launched SPRX in large part to find the undervalued areas of particularly B2B industrial use of tech. Talk to us from a macro perspective geographically where you are worried about, because there was serious signs of some European slowdown. Is that going to be long lasting? Do we think that that can be offset by this just insatiable demand for artificial intelligence? Yeah, well, Caroline, interestingly, technology is going to be one of the least sensitive to the economy sector. So while you're going to see some movement, like, for example, in consumer technology, we see some downside in autos. We're seeing a lot of negative data points on the EV side. We saw similar impact on semiconductor mm -hmm. companies that sell to autos. So we believe that consumer is going to be where the downside is going to be in the near term here, driven by the economy and really high interest rates. Uh, so those areas of the economy are going to be more sensitive, and that's what we are avoiding. However, enterprise just went through a down cycle in spending. Companies already cut their budgets to a pretty low level. So we see those comps being pretty favorably positioned going into 2024. So areas like cloud, data infrastructure, cybersecurity, we think those are going to be good areas to, uh, to be into in uh, uh, next year. Ivana, I always wanted to ask you how much you nerd out, how deep you go on the details on a product like this, right? We're going to look at some pictures of the MI300. You know, a lot of the work in the market this morning is based on what Lisa Su had to say. Do you go through the specs of these semiconductors and, and go with your own conviction call based on deep research, or do you just go based on the commentary of executives? So we do very fundamental deep research and what we, where we differentiate ourselves is that we read data across, across the value chain. So we're going to be talking to companies like Microsoft that are going to be partnering with companies like NVIDIA. We're talking to smaller cap companies that sell liquid cooling to the data center um, segment, that are selling casings to the data center segment. So we gather these data points from multiple sources, and that gives us confidence in where the data center spending cycle is going. So it really is not about just following what management is saying. Is really trying to understand how they're positioned in the ecosystem by getting data points from the supply chain. You've been doing that sort of deep research at Deutsche, at Citadel, at Millennium, global companies with global perspectives. Give us the global take on how much AMD is going to be exposed to China and the rift that continues when it comes to the tit to tat in technology. Well, China is going to be a big risk to both AMD and Nvidia, and we're going to see how the geopolitics. We don't necessarily make geopolitical. So we're going to see how that evolves over the next few years. But it's a pretty large market, and both AMD and NVIDIA are very well positioned there because they're really the only game in town. And the consumer side in China of enterprise mm -hmm. companies is pretty large, and they're pretty big consumers of this, this product. So if they're shut down from this market, we do see the upside going maybe five years out being really capped and, um, and we see earnings stalling out then. But for the next three years, we do see strong demand just from U.S. Um, domestic hyperscalers and enterprises. We've not really seen enterprises participate in this uh, cycle yet. So we do see pretty significant near-term up upside in the next two to three years.
Ivana De Lovasco of Spear Invest. Great to catch up with you. And thank you for that technical expertise as well. We appreciate it. All right, sticking with chips and earnings. I'm looking at shares of Qualcomm reporting after market. The story here really simple. How does the smartphone market look globally, right? Qualcomm's the main player in smartphone chipsets. The forecast adjusted revenues 8.51 billion, but that would represent a 25% drop in sales year on year. Has the smartphone market bottomed out? And as we discussed with the Qualcomm CEO uh, last week, a big part of their next play is PC processors. What will they have to say about that, Caroline? Yeah, meanwhile, so much more to say when it comes to the world of artificial intelligence and indeed how you regulate it, how you make it safe. We're going to the outskirts of London next, where a UK summit is on all around artificial intelligence safety. Let's break it all down. There's a Blue Met Technology. I expect lots of governments to now see their own AI safety initiatives. And I think one thing we really have to think about is how this network of initiatives comes together. And what I've proposed is an IPCC style body called an international panel on AI safety to coordinate on the right standards for safety between all of these bodies. Just as we've had um, with climate change, a group of the really top scientists in the world try to establish consensus on what are we actually developing today, what capabilities do these AIs have, and what does the next five to ten years look like? And that needs to be impartial. The UK Summit on AI Safety. It is underway and earlier, well, Bloomberg caught up with the CEO of Google's DeepMind about the future benefits of artificial intelligence. Just take a listen. I think the message that we bring is one of cautious optimism. Mm. Obviously, we're working on this technology because we think it will be one of the most beneficial technologies to society ever. Um, but it does come with, with attendant risks, as all transformative technologies do. And I think we need to take those seriously, uh, ranging from the near-term risks to the, to the longer-term uh, uh, technological risks. Uh, and I think we need to start an international dialogue about that now. So it's fantastic to see this happening, the summit. And there is divergence from policymakers, but there's also divergence and quite passionate splits within your own community. You're very aware of this. The head of AI at Meta, Jan LeCun, saying, name-checking you and saying, you're fear-mongering, there's maybe regulatory capture going on here. Your response to that critique, because Jan LeCun isn't alone, there are others who mm -hmm. say, quote-unquote, it is preposterous to mm -hmm. talk about some of these existential risks, fear-mongering. Is that what you're doing, Dennis? No, of course not. And in, in, in there's equal luminaries on the other side of the yes. camp as well, including some of uh, Jan's uh, fellow Turing Award winners. And, and we've all known each other for a long time, actually, for the academic community. So, um, and, and as far as sort of regulatory capture and other things, I think that's pretty preposterous. We've been, myself and Shane Legger, one of my other co-founders of DeepMind, have been talking about AI safety since we were postdocs and academics in 2009. So, before we'd even started uh, our companies. So I think it comes from uh, a genuine, actually, uncertainty mm -hmm. around where the technology can go. It's en enormously powerful, we know, and that's why we will work our whole lives on it, all of us. Uh, we think it can bring incredible benefits to science and medicine and, uh, uh, and climate and environment and can actually help us uh, and help society face some of our greatest challenges um, and solve some of those challenges. But, um, you, you know, the, the, in terms of where the technology is going to go and the capabilities it will have, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Mm. And I think it's good there's disagreement, uh, and even amongst the academic fraternity, and that just shows you that's why we have to proceed with cautious optimism. Mm. You know, we want to make sure we get the benefits of the innovation and the promise that the technology clearly holds, um, but we've got to be uh, uh, doing it in a responsible way, I would say using a scientific method, trying to have as much foresight on the technology uh, as possible so we, we predict ahead of time what the in unintended consequences might be. I guess for, for some it's the emphasis and the Deputy Prime Minister himself speaking to us earlier said this is very much this summit focused on frontier technology mm -hmm. so the next models that DeepMind and others may be coming yes. out within the next 12 months or yes. so. Others would say look we need to focus on the more prosaic risks of the mm -hmm. here and now, the misinformation, mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. security. Uh, those issues are not being given enough weight, yeah. the, the, the critics would say. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I mean, I, I think that, that, that actually even in the summit, there's, there's, there's many um, sessions on the, the near-term risks, mm. and all of us in the Frontier Labs are also thinking a lot about um, near-term harms and how to mitigate those. Demis Hassoubi, CEO of Google DeepMind there. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us now from the ground at the AI summit, of course, conducted that conversation. It's kind of like a who's who in the world of AI. Elon Musk yeah. is there, right, Tom? But from a political perspective, 
the world's leaders have not turned up. So how much is Rishi Sunak leaning in on Elon Musk, of all people, being there? Well, Elon Musk certainly, look, a lot of your friends, Ed and Caroline, are on the ground today. Sam Altman's here, of course, of Open AI. Elon Musk is here. Eric Schmidt is here. You have DeepMind's Demis Osiris, of course. So they really have bought the power list in terms of those driving the innovation within technology. But you're right. Look, there's on the edges maybe a little bit of disappointment that you don't have the French president here, that you don't have the German chancellor. But... I will stress this. The UK government, they say, look, we're actually pretty relaxed. You've got von der Leyen, the European Commission president. You've got the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, is here. You've got the Japanese representation. You've got Chinese representation. So they would say, look, the leaders are here. And crucially, those executives are here. Elon Musk certainly helps the UK in its kind of PR effort, certainly. And what they have managed to achieve is sign off on this communique, 28 different nations. And that's no mean feat, right? Getting China on board with the US, with the UK, on signing off on the need to protect against what they describe as these catastrophic risks. Yeah, and there was much made of China being part of this conversation, but it needs to be a global agreement, a global yeah. narrative, if we're going to have guardrails here, Tom. What do you expect to actually be coming out in terms of hard regulatory policy? Already we've been hearing from the US, already enacting mm. an executive order, for example. Yeah, so you've got, the, you've got the communique, which is a consensus around protecting against some of these risks. But that's all it is. It's a consensus. There's no regulatory concrete action that comes on the back of this. They'll be hoping that that follows in six months' time. South Korea will host their summit. Then six months after that, it'll be France. But look, you're absolutely right. There is a divergent picture when it comes to the regulatory response whether that is the EU AI Act that they hope to put into law next year or the executive action of the US or China's own regulatory regime. And it's interesting because you speak to certain people like Demis, but also Inflection CEO as well, the Inflection AI CEO saying, look, we need to have kind of a global oversight body. And others push back on that. We spoke to the senior vice president of IBM, said that's just not going to happen. You're not going to be able to get that global consensus. You need to work through the agencies that already exist. So, look, there are divisions in terms of that regulatory framework, how it works, the implementation. But there are also divisions amongst executives themselves, tech executives, in terms of how you define risks and how you define the regulations that are needed to contain some of those risks. So the gap is huge at a time, of course, when we know the innovation is coming through at a very rapid pace. Whole load of summitry to be done. There's a couple of more days, of course. It's today, it is tomorrow. And, of course, the all important X discussion going on between Elon Musk and Rishi Sunak after the event. Tom McKenzie on the ground for us over there in Buckinghamshire. We thank him very much for it. Meanwhile, coming up, funding an AI scientist. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt is in the UK at the moment, but he's also been lending a hand to a non-profit with ambitious plans to build an AI system capable of scientific research. We have more on that next. Ed, what have you got? Yeah, just a real quick look at shares of Wayfair. Another one that had been lower and then suddenly, boop, off it goes higher, up 5%. Analysts really impressed with the profitability in the e-commerce context and the fintech context with this stock, up 5.4%. This is Bloomberg Technology. Here's Talking Tech. First up, WeWork shares slumping by as much as 50% today after a Wall Street Journal report about its plans to file for bankruptcy. A spokesperson for the company said it would, quote, not comment on speculation. And interest internet companies in Southeast Asia like C and Grab are facing their slowest growth in years. Researchers say online spending is expected to rise by 11% this year, but down from 20% a year earlier and its lowest rate going back to 2017. This comes as consumers in the region pull back on their spending. Plus, new emails shown in the DOJ lawsuit against Google are shedding new light about the blurry line between search and advertising. In 2019, the former head of Google search raised concerns that his team was, quote, getting too involved with ads after Googly internally declared, declared a code yellow amid revenue concerns. Speculation swirled that its search team had sometimes been pulled into the advertising side of the business. Google has pushed back on that very idea. Caroline. Now, speaking of Google, the former CEO of that business, Eric Schmidt, well, he's venturing further into the non-profit space by lending his funds, his expertise, to an AI-powered research initiative called Future House. 
Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos joins us from Washington with a great story all about basically they're assuming that the scientific process in and of itself needs to be accelerated by AI, not just the actual finding of scientific breakthroughs. That's right, Caroline. What Future House really wants to do here is not just advance breakthroughs like the alpha fold protein folding breakthrough that we saw in the last couple years that really cracked open AI's potential in science. What Future House wants to do is actually advance the process itself. Now, a lot of us kind of have to go back to that high school, you know, laboratory where we were learning about how to create a hypothesis, doing the research, and then ultimately testing that. But there's a lot of bottlenecks here that Future House says they can solve, starting with the ability to make new hypotheses at a greater scale and much faster, perhaps more accurate than humans can. And the way they want to do that is with this AI scientist. So they plan to kind of build their own AI system that can ingest thousands and thousands of papers at a much bigger scale than a human scientist can and eventually start to semi-autonomously come up with hypotheses of its own. What's interesting about this story is there are loads of startups and big companies working on applying AI in the sciences, biotechnology, pharma, drug discovery. This is a non-profit and it's focused in academia. Tell us who the people are behind Future House, Jackie. That was by design, Ed. Now, of course, Eric Schmidt is by far the largest backer here. The organization plans to have his backing for at least the first five years. It expects to spend about $20 million in the next year up until next. And a lot of that funding is going to go to talent and building what's called a wet laboratory, much like what we would see in an academic institution or even some of these industry-led research labs. But the reason it's a nonprofit is because it doesn't want to have the pressure to make money or pump out products. And so that's where you have Eric Schmidt saying he wants the incentives really aligned to advance the research itself, not having its attention diverted by, you know, other priorities that perhaps might come from investors or the market itself. All right. Well, thanks to Bloomberg's Jackie Davalos out in D.C. there. Now, coming up here on the program, Olive AI to wind down business operations and sell business units. We're going to discuss what is going on in the world, monetary policy, its impact on artificial intelligence and the environment startups. Carrot. Yeah, meanwhile, let's talk about environments for certain companies that are no longer startups. Splunk, currently off by just a quarter of a percent, it's to see, but cutting about 7% of its global workforce. It's an uncertain economic environment that they say, one, of course, that the Federal Reserve is having to navigate. And, of course, uh, the all-important plan acquisition by Cisco, having to re retract around the market. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. A quick check in on European markets. The equities market in Europe has just closed. The stock 600 Europe, which is kind of this continent wide gauge of equities, up for a third straight day, seven tenths of one percent. A lot of the trading that's going on in Europe or did go on in Europe throughout Wednesday session was kind of ahead of the Fed, a drumbeat to and treading water towards this afternoon's Fed decision because, of course, Fed and rates policy has an impact on the global economy. But there was also some pullback in some of the sort of benchmark European yields. We're looking at the German 10-year bund, 2.75% on its yield, and euro dollar slipping for a euro against the dollar for a second straight day. Remember, for one week only, we're checking in on these European markets because of the time difference and how exciting it is. Caroline. And indeed, it is all kind of dictated by U.S. macro policy. Let's dig in on what's happening in the U.S. markets right now. We are up. Well, six tenths, seven tenths of a percent, let's call it, on the Nasdaq 100. Interesting desire to be getting into technology names on a day where perhaps we had some mixed data coming out from the U.S. I mean, overall, we've sort of trying to be reading the tea leaves of what's being disclosed when it comes to job openings actually climbing, but U.S. factory gauge slumping. Nevertheless, some movement towards some of the tech names. Bitcoin on the downside, the dollar stays pretty flat, but we do remain at about 34,000 elevated level. U.S. 10-year yield, though, this is what to watch. Bond markets rallying, 12 basis points to the downside. This is the Treasury said it will sell $112 billion in longer-term securities, actually sort of slowing that growth of issuance. But notably, we are thinking that the Federal Reserve is going to be holding those interest rates steady at a 22-year high, of course, in their meeting today. Maybe they could hike later in the year. 
what does that sort of policy mean for sort of hearts and minds in terms of allocating capital towards technology names in the private sector and the public sector? We want to discuss the Fed conversation, its implication, in particular for AI investors and how should they be thinking about monetary policy. I'm pleased to say Joe Chow's with us. He's the co-founder and managing partner over at Millennia Capital and someone who worked for the Fed knows how to think about the implications of valuations of companies. And you actually think, look, this AI, some call it a mini bubble, is not a bubble if you're looking at where interest rates ultimately are. Exactly. And look, in our view, um, the AI super cycle is just starting this year. This is year one. And that the, the, the bubble is not going to peak or burst for five to 10 years in our view. There's a couple of reasons for why. If you look at historical tech bubbles like crypto, we had 10 to 12 years of QE loose monster policy. And in 2001, when the dot-com bubble bursted, we had 10 years of fiscal policy, fiscal surplus. So usually these tech bubbles, innovation bubbles, tend to form when you have one of these following conditions, loose monster policy, uh, uh, strong markets, or strong um, uh, economy. And in 2023, we have anything but that. We have tight monster policy with QT. We have, uh, we have a very difficult market. And my point is, if AI has been this um, big and important, then imagine when the Fed normalizes and when the markets kind of resume, um, um, then, then how big the AI bubble could, could become. I'm interested, you're obviously backing some of the key names that we talk a lot about on the show, the coheres of this world, the stability AIs, even though there's some management concerns with that business. I'm interested though, on a day where we see Olive AI, for example, once worth $4 billion valuation in 2021 when it last raised some funds, and now it basically sells off parts of the business and has to fold. What is the distinguishing factor between companies that can't make it through and companies that can? Yeah, so you know, I've been having these conversations with a lot of investors and founders. So basically, I've been asked, what is AI? And I said, AI is software squared. Think about how big uh, of an impact internet and soft, uh, software have had on our lives, business and consumer lives. AI is going to be much, much bigger. So by the same token, you can, you can, you can value a, a, a software company on a price to revenue, on a, on a, on a price to uh, gross profit, to EBITDA free cash to LTV, CAC, and all these operating metrics, you would value an AI company by the same token, and you would value kind of like uh, the company based on long-term DCF. And so yes, some of these AI companies are uh, overvalued, but that's because they're growing fast. So the growth rate, price, the earnings, uh, earnings growth, the revenue growth is, is justified, or because, um, because the, the total addressable market is big, or there's such a, a strong moat. So some of the companies that you know, are not sustainable may not exemplify one of those uh, characteristics. Joe, Caroline and I were reflecting this morning on a conversation we kind of had throughout the year, but it started with Vinod Kosler that 90% of these new startups, in other words, ones that were founded this year in the AI domain, won't survive. But I kind of like, it's a conversation that I've always had covering venture capital, mm -hmm. right? You look at your portfolio, aren't 90% of them not going to make it anyway? That, that, that's the power law of venture capital is not every company is going to make it. But when, when I take a step back and I look at the ecosystem, you know, I'm really, really excited about uh, this juncture where AI has really introduced a lot of life back, in, back into, into the ecosystem, where AI has created this whole new greenfield um, in which many new companies will be born. And, and, and there will be many useful applications that will be, that'll be built in cancer research, in healthcare services, uh, and, and, and et cetera. And so not every company is going to make it, but the ones, but you know, I, I compare this 2023 moment to sort of where we were in 2010 for the cloud. And 2010 was when we, when we were coming out of the GFC when, when markets were recovering. And, and, and maybe the 2002 moment. And so the companies that do, um, uh, that will stay, uh, that will survive this sort of kind of washout are poised to stay. And, and you're seeing you know, some of the most impressive growth numbers from OpenAI, from Anthropic, from Cohere. And, and we're really confident to say that the, um, the AI market is here to stay and that it's going to have a huge impact on our uh, business and consumer lives. There's been a debate this week about what's going to be bigger for global financial markets, the Fed this afternoon or Apple earnings on Thursday evening. Let's stick with the Fed. If you are a venture capitalist or you're a long term private investor, why do you care about monetary policy? Why do you track rates and the direction of travel for rates? Well, there's two things. Um, one is venture capital assets are just equities, and that's no different than public equities. It's just that public equities trade, you know, move every millisecond, but venture capital assets don't move. But if you're a VC, you need to understand where rates are, where discount rates are going, and what the exit uh, markets will look like. And that's going to impact sort of uh, valuations in your portfolio. And then secondly is, is, is you know, um, let me say this now, that the Fed is done, we're near done. And you know, in my view, the only direction the federal funds rate is going to go absent any sort of 
uh, black swan events in the next few years is downwards. You know, right now we're at 5.5 and a little bit higher. You know, absent you know black swan events, the federal funds rate will kind of go down from five five and a half to maybe three to four percent, maybe maybe two percent. And so, were discount rates to, to kind of compress by by 20, 20 bips points, 20 bips, that's going to lead to equity valuation expansion, and that's going to be a healthy um, uh, movement for the public markets in tech and private markets and comparables. So, you know, that's why we're really excited about this juncture is the Fed's almost done. We're starting a new, a new, a new business cycle and AI has really introduced a lot of new activities in the market. And, and so this may be actually one of the, one of the best times to invest in AI. That, that is an answer that I think Caroline addresses a lot of the questions that our global technology audience has. Joe Chow, Millennia Capital, great to have you back on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you. Now, coming up here on the show, we'll continue the conversation on AI and talk regulation and investment in the space. That's the next conversation. Caro. Meanwhile, let's talk about desire to be spending money on big deals. Some news crossing the wire that, well, Endeavor, you know, the company of talent agency and behind Ultimate Fighting Champion as well, well a private equity firm, Silver Lake, is turning to its closest partner in the Middle East to back one of its own largest ever buyout deal proposals. The PE firm is in talks to team up with Abu Dhabi's wealth fund, Mamadala, in a potential takeover of Endeavor. Just check out the shares popping 2.5%. Endeavor so far not commenting. This is Bloomberg Technology. Now, business officials told a Senate panel on artificial intelligence that Congress must take a more active role in regulating the use of AI, particularly in the workplace. For more on how the technology is impacting the workforce, let's just bring in Bloomberg's Joe Constance, who's got a great story really on, at the moment, the myriad of state by state, region by region rules that are coming in, I think of here in New York in particular, but nothing from a federal level that's protecting the worker, right? Right. So, and that's what um, these these folks from the business community were really calling for. Because if you have this patchwork of local and state regulations, it can make it really difficult for companies uh, who are developing new technologies to figure out how to how to even proceed. So, some 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 folks were calling for um, federal action on this on this. In particular, looking at AI and hiring. I think that's a big mm -hmm. one. And as you mentioned, there's a New York City law looking at. Uh, bias in AI uh, software that, reg you know, in order to regulate um, those sorts of programs being used for employment decisions. Now, therein comes the ongoing issue with regulation and new technology, which is do you stifle innovation? How much are you seeing this pull in the push being discussed at a Congress level? Yeah, so that was a big part of the conversation at the hearing yesterday. Um, and. I think that there are, you know, it's it's really tough for lawmakers to, to figure out how to proceed here because I think that there are, um, you know, arguments on both sides that, uh, you know, on one side, folks say that, you know, AI has holds a lot of risk for workers and mm -hmm. may even result in displacement um, of people's jobs on a large scale. Um, and then on the other side, people say, that's really not going to happen. You know, we're going to see people shifting into new jobs. We're going to see people learning new skills. And um, so it's hard to know for Congress um, at, at this point in particular, you know, how exactly they should proceed, how tightly they should be regulating versus letting uh, private companies do their own thing the ongoing debate. Joe Constance, great to have you. Thank you very much indeed on that important story. And it's something that's being discussed in the UK right now as well, Ed. It is, and that's the topic of discussion in today's VC Spotlight. We're going to hone in on investing in artificial intelligence, but with the context that right now in the United Kingdom, there is an AI summit underway. Joining us, James Wise, a partner at Balderton Capital, big presence in the UK and Europe. And what does the summit like this actually mean? James, for the ecosystem of startups working on AI in the UK in particular, is there any actually tangible action that will come in supporting that industry? Well, overall, it's a very positive thing, right? We want to see international collaboration. We want to see regulation that's clear and forward thinking. Uh, but obviously, our aperture here is really how is this going to affect entrepreneurs on a day to day basis coming into the market and their ability to raise capital. And what we're looking at is how will regulation of models or access to the tools like open source solutions affect the desire of entrepreneurs to try innovating in this space and the ability of investors to really make a difference and help build big businesses here? What this summit has done is literally put in front of the camera 
the talent in the UK, you know, deep mind being the obvious example. Are there any particular advantages or strengths that you feel the UK has um, in the field of artificial intelligence, be it academic or be it the private sector? Yeah, look, we have a broad range of software successes, right? Whether it's in fintech or it's in uh, deep tech uh, or even in the life sciences. And actually what we're seeing is research in AI now proliferating through into industrial applications and being taken up by leading software businesses to make a difference for users. And ultimately that's what matters. Having people here is fantastic, but making sure that they work on an international level is still gonna be important. You know, the UK is a great market, but when we invest in businesses here, we're not investing in UK businesses to win in the UK. We want them to be impactful on a global scale. And that's why having something like the Global AI Safety Summit uh, is incredibly beneficial. It's interesting, of course, some of your investments include Writer, and we've interviewed founder of that business who's permanently jetting across from London to SF and back, building a global AI business. What are valuations like, James, in the UK? Because we're just talking about how they're pretty elevated here in the US. Yeah, well, look, the amount of money from venture investors going into AI has grown significantly in the UK over the last year. It's grown by about 70%. AI has now just overtaken fintech this year in terms of the main area that VCs are putting dollars. And obviously that creates competition and it drives up valuations for early stage investments. I think what's different about AI investing right now versus some software uh, valuations driven maybe you know, a couple of years ago is that revenues are really following, right? There is incredible demand, both at the enterprise level and at the consumer level for these new tools. Now, we need to make sure that demand converts into usage and that people really get benefit out of it. But a lot of the high valuations you're seeing are actually underpinned by very fast growing revenues. I put to you, to you a question that we just uh, had a chat with Joe Chow about. And there's one company, for example, we're starting to get a few of these companies actually failing now. We had Olive mm. AI, one of these companies that was worth four billion back in 2021 and is now selling off parts of the business and basically unwinding. How do you discern a moat? How do you decide which company is the one that's going to be able to push through when a lot of the firepower within AI is costly and ends up being owned by some of the big oligopolies, shall we say? Yeah, and look, AI is an incredibly broad term, right? What we've seen over the last year is an explosion in the capabilities of generative AI. And in fact, that's completely ruined the business models of some businesses that were building their own uh, models at scale. And so there's going to be disruption. There will be failures. You know, what we're looking for right now in a period of very fast technical change and innovation are founders and product teams who can adapt and deploy these new technologies to find ways to really bring value for the customers. You know, I think you did a great uh, summary earlier of AMD's new earnings and, and forecasts. We right. all know the story of NVIDIA. Right now, a lot of the value is being captured at that level, at the cloud level, uh, with the hyperscalers or with the chip producers. What we're looking for is the businesses who can navigate through this changing landscape and capture value by providing services to people. James, you raise a really good point because many of the founders that Caroline and I speak to, the first thing they think about when they wake up literally is compute. It's expensive and it's hard to secure. Do UK startups have access to that compute? Yeah, it's a, it is a challenge. You know, the UK locally has about a sixth uh, or a sixth in the world in terms of the amount of compute that it has nationally, well behind the US and China. Um, however, you know, we do have uh, some local centres. We've just announced in the UK funding for an exascale uh, computing centre as well, which will help. And international funds like Boulderton have relationships with the likes of NVIDIA and others um, so that we can provide access to cloud. You know, this weekend in London, we're providing uh, access to uh, 300 hackers. I think it's the biggest hackathon uh, in the UK. Hackathon. <laughs> Hackathon alerts. Um, uh, two uh, tools for free of charge, you know, subsidized by us and the providers to help them start getting on the scale and learning how to use these tools. And I think things like that and things like deals with NVIDIA here in the UK means that entrepreneurs here can compete and lead in the field. Remember to invite us to your hackathons. James Wise of Borders and Capital, thank you very much. So coming started. up here on the show, Meta, <laughs> set, Meta set to get hit by EU data policies that will impact how it advertises to customers. We have those details next. This is Bloomberg.
Meta set to be hit by a privacy crackdown in the EU over its trove of personal data that it uses to target users with ads. Joining us more, our big tech editor, Bloomberg Sarah Fryer. So the mechanics of this are interesting and important. What they're saying is you, you can't take the data from your big platforms and use it in how you target those users with ads. Right. They're saying that the data collection and the scale at which Meta has done it across Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger is, is beyond what consumers have agreed to and, and takes away their choice. Uh, and so what Meta has done is they've operated or they've, they've released this free version, this ad-free version, um, thinking that that would satisfy regulators and say, you know, we're giving users a choice here. They, they don't have to have ads. Um, it's a sort of a calculated move on Meta's part, but because people probably won't use that one. Um, that said, regulators aren't sure that that necessarily satisfies them. And Meta is saying that, that you know, they, yeah. they have had discussions over the course of, of many months trying to get to a place where they can still operate in Europe, but it, it looks a little tenuous right now. Meta saying in a statement, and you're so right, Sarah, they've been aware of this plan for weeks and we were already fully engaged with them to arrive at a satisfactory outcome for all parties, but the ban is unjustifiably ignores that careful, robust regulatory process. So where next? Because this is really stemming from Norway, right? They've already clamped down in this way. They're already getting fines on a daily basis. How harsh could this get? I mean, it could, it could be something that we see in all of Europe. Um, we could see that this ad-free version gets uh, maybe deeper scrutiny as to whether it, it collects data still. Uh, I think you know, users aren't as concerned about whether they have ads or not uh, compared to how much data is, is taken from them. So, so I think that that's, um, that's what we'll come to next. Already, Meta has pulled back from Europe. R remember that Threads, the new Instagram platform, wasn't launched there. Um, so they are they are trying to be uh, a little bit more cautious in the region, and that's difficult for the company because it is one of their more lucrative ad regions uh, around the world. Sarah Fryer, great to break that down. We thank you. The ongoing focus of regulators on Meta. Meanwhile, let's talk about regulation here in the U.S. when it comes to crypto, and indeed, well, a trial that's going on. We all know the crypto fraud trial of FTX coming to a close this week after Sam Bankman-Fried finished testifying, and prosecutors make their final pitch to the jury. Emotion Ali Basa is going to be back at the courthouse tomorrow. And people have been like what, getting there at 1, 2 in the morning, basically, to get into this courthouse. What are we anticipating? How quickly could any sort of judgment be made here? Uh, well, it could be as early as the end of this week. It could go into next week in theory here, because the jury has to deliberate. But they are looking to get to a conclusion. What you're going through today is we have Sam Bigman-Fried, who wrapped up his own testimony just yesterday. And now today, you're watching the prosecution really come in with closing remarks, using Sam Bigman-Fried's own testimony against him. So what they are now saying is you saw him come in early uh, to his own defense, very clear worded, very clear headed. And a day later, you saw him walk into the prosecution, stumbling over many definitions, stumbling over many things that the the prosecution put right in front of him books, articles uh, as to what he had said and then watching him either not remember right. or deny what has been written or said about him. What was SBF's defense beyond basically saying I, I wasn't a very good CEO? Well, that's the main defense, isn't it? This idea that they didn't have the right risk management in place. And the idea here was not just that, you know, he wasn't a very good CEO, but he was trying to show that he wasn't actually there or uh, responsible for certain amounts of the decisions made over at Alameda while Caroline Ellison was running it. That's the distance he tried to create from himself. Because remember, he's trying to convince a jury, many of which were not aware of what had happened the last year, a couple of years at FTX, were not aware of many of the inner workings of the the crypto industry and we're not aware of a lot of um, you know what was allowed and what was not allowed in terms of margin loans as he has said Alameda had taken from FTX but the prosecution is coming down hard and going against um, him in terms of the discrepancies in how he had shown what had happened over in FTX. Shalana Basak is going to be back at that courthouse in New York we thank her. Meanwhile that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology today Ed. Shout out podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. We have it everywhere from SF in New York City. This is Bloomberg Technology.